This is Braverly. She lives in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. She is a sweet soul and is filled with joy. I can say the exact same thing about this little girl. Her name is Laureen. I consider myself blessed to have had the opportunity to spend several weeks with these kids and many others in Haiti. Now I'm going to tell you something that is really difficult to understand. Both of these girls were in the devastating 2010 earthquake. One of them lost her parents and her home and now lives with her sisters, cousins, and grandmother in a tent city. The other one comes from a family of 10 kids with two loving parents, all of which were untouched by the earthquake. The part that is hard to understand is how both girls can have such joyful spirits with such different past experiences. The more I was around them, the more I didn't understand it. If I had been through something half as difficult as them, I would be devastated and depressed. I needed to find out where this joy was coming from. This is Braverly's mom, Nicole, and her dad, Pastor Pierre. She also has nine brothers and sisters. After being around the Pierre family for a few days, I started realizing where the joy inside Lorene was coming from. With ten children of their own and no job, they were hardly in a position to help, but they didn't let that stop them from doing what they believed was the right thing to do. They had very little, but they shared it with those that had less. Haiti 10 is a film that takes you inside their home and the community where the Pierre family lives in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. It tells the other part of the story that, that you do not hear on the news. It's the story of good things happening following a disaster. The film is kind of more of a collaborative art project rather than a traditional film. Um, you know, the crew is made up of musicians, photographers, filmmakers, writers, creative advocates for those less fortunate. Our hope was to create a film that moves the viewer in a similar manner of how we were impacted. But I never, at any moment, during the news of that earthquake and all the media coverage and everything, uh, I never at any moment thought that I'd be playing any kind of a role in their, uh, in their community at any time soon. Like about three years ago, I had a bunch of kind of realizations and, um, which opened up my eyes that orphans are real. And I'd seen them on the TV, kind of, but always felt like guilty and didn't trust the mechanisms of helping them out. And I'm like, oh, they're so far away. But uh, my best friend started working with an orphan uh, company or ministry, started telling me about it. And I'm like, okay, there's like 165 million orphans. I'm like, that's horrible, but that's a huge number. It was overwhelming. But he kept on talking to me, so I planted a little seed. And then I saw a Slumdog Millionaire. And Jai Ho! The Jai Ho song stuck in me, and, and the three kids became real. And I'm like, and I felt God's hand kind of upon me. I'm all, oh, whoa, these kids are real. And I know a lot of people, and maybe I can do something good about it. Wasn't fully convinced. And then I got cancer, and that was a whole story. But when you get cancer, I felt like God takes you to the end of your life where you're all alone on that operating table. You're all alone when you're getting chemo. And all the material things I was worried about um, were gone. And, and then I went, he brought me to that place, and then I went to Nairobi, Kenya, and I went into the slums, and I saw all these little girls that were unprotected, potentially getting violated, and I'm like, I felt like my heart got ripped out to them, and, and vice versa, they got put inside me forever. And at that moment, I committed my life. I'm like, I don't know what it's going to take, but I want to try to do something good in my sphere of influence for the rest of my life for these kids. When John brought this project to the table, um, literally to the table over a lunch date we had, uh, 
uh, the Fayetteville Caribe. Um, I immediately said yes. I didn't even have to think twice about it. And then I walked out of the restaurant and I immediately said, no, <laughs> I can't do this. And then I said yes. And for the next, I don't know, a few months, I struggled. Um, the whole while, knowing I had to do this project, my initial reaction was, was the correct reaction, which was, yes, of course, I'm going to be involved. The film. John and I were a part of a team that went to Haiti in July and we hosted a sports camp there with the people in the church and um, between our first trip and that trip really just got to know this family and on our flight home we had the opportunity to sit together on the leg of the trip and just talk about our hearts for this family and how much they'd impacted our lives. And we just started to daydream. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could bring their story to the world? And uh, John had mentioned to Bikinson that he uh, had asked uh, Bikinson who his favorite musician was. And Bikinson had said, oh, it's Victor. And John's like, really? I happened to photograph Victor not too long ago. And that dream started that day. Wouldn't it be amazing? If Victor would come to Haiti to meet Bikinson, how cool would that be? Because you have this young man who's pouring his life out in his community, and to be able to do something that special for him would be really cool. So it really started on that flight home, just with a daydream, and uh, you know, an idea, so many ideas of things that we can do to to share with the world the love that we've seen in this family. You know, we've all heard about Haiti. But most of us are kind of on the peripheral. You know, it's still a news story, a, a, a past news story, you know. Um, so to actually get, a, get the opportunity to, uh, you know, to come here, um, th that was a, 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 an interesting possibility, you know, when I read the email and I was starting to talk about it with Danette. But also I get a lot of, you know, different emails and, you know, sorry to say most of them never happen. But this one just sounded like there was a spark to it, you know. There was something that really touched me on the inside, that this was something f first that I really wanted to do. And then the next thing was trying to find the time to see if it was even possible. But again, I talked to my manager, Danette, and I, um, we have our own system where she brings everything to the table, and I kind of let her know what I really want to do. And she also does the same thing, what I should do. But with this one, we were both on it. We were like, wow, this is a great opportunity. So John says, dude, I'm, I'm going to go to Haiti. And I said, Haiti? What's in Haiti? He said, I don't know. I said, oh, OK. Well, you have to tell me all about it when you come back. So then he came back, um, and he was forever changed. It, it altered the, his perception on, on, on the world. Even him having grown up in, in, in uh, South Africa and in Kenya, it still was a totally different, different feel. Um, and then when he and Pete came back from the second trip and they talked about how much love that they found there, how much pure friendship, good souls, smiles, it sounded almost heaven sent. And then you get into the footage of the video, and it's impoverished, you know. It, it, it's sick looking, you know, like completely underdeveloped. It's a, it's a catastrophe, you know. Um, that sort of juxtaposition of those two things impacted me incredibly. The, the answer had to be yes. The idea that, that I could somehow capture and embrace um, that that level of soulfulness, that level of spirituality um, that they saw and that they captured on film, and that I could somehow enhance that through an original you know, soundtrack. What, what a challenge and what a brilliant idea I had to take it on. You know, faith, music, and love is basically the three elements, if you will, that I believe ring true every person around the world regardless of who you are. Um, I think it's three kind of intrinsic things that make up who you are as a person. Um, 
you could you could just as easily you know take those three words and ask the three questions of who are you, what do you do, and how do you express yourself. I think the idea that spirituality, uh, love, and music being not fundamental, not survival elements, things that you can go without day to day, is ridiculous, and it doesn't make any sense. I can't, I can't live without it, I can't function without it. The fundamental requirements to my existence, but I think most people seem to think that it's what you've got, uh, physical elements, maybe how much money you have, how many cars you drive, the square footage of your home, or, I don't know, the leather sofa, the, 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 the nice stuff maybe makes you who you are. Um, it's not, that's not real. I think what Haiti 10 does is calls that into question. It, it, maybe it asks, isn't there so much more than the stuff that you've got? The, I, the concept from the outside of it, Maybe these people not having a whole lot, but the reality is, again, kind of echoing what Victor said, is once you get on the inside, you find out they actually have a lot. And, and maybe even, in fact, a lot more than, than we might. Everybody wants the same thing in life, you know? And at the end of the day, what we have is each other. And that's, yeah, that, that's, that's what Haiti teaches you. This film does one thing, I hope it does that. Um, I don't think that I can come to your country and tell you anything that you don't already know. So I will just tell you how I feel.